Good evening. My name is Dr. Wayne King. I'm here today to interview Jensen Lionel Gilbert Baker, who is the president of Manpower Enterprise. This company specializes in the movement of mindfulness throughout the city. Today we are interviewing Coach Baker, as he is affectionately called. We are interviewing him concerning toddlers and infants and cognitive and social and emotional behavior. The first question, Coach Baker, how does mindfulness really relates to cognitive development in adolescents or in toddlers and infants? Thank you, Mr. Wing. When we look at cognitive development and mindfulness, first let's look at the definition of cognitive development. This is a period of time from birth to five years old when the child starts to think, learn, and solve problems. It also develops in the child pre-reading skills, vocabulary, numerical skills, and language. The child begins to be very playful, but the biggest toy is actually you, the parent. The child begins to climb, he begins to recognize, he begins to recognize his own pictures, most pictures that he recognizes are those that are realistic. The child begins to understand who his parents are and he begins to figure out those that are close to him are those that he miss when they are away. So cognitive development, when mindfulness is inserted, it is because these kids, even at a younger age, have some type of stress problems. And of course, with mindfulness, being able to be aware and to pay attention, this helps the toddler and the infant in this growing process. So, Coach Baker, how can toddlers benefit from mindfulness at an early age? As I mentioned before, this is the age where the toddler and infant begins to think, problem solve, and learn. Now, in this process, stress will develop even at this early age. Take, for instance, that when a toddler is in his own world, playing on the floor with his pictures or with his toys, and an adult comes to pick him up, and the adult says, it's time to go bye-bye. So they reach down and pick the toddler up and heads out of the door. Picture yourself being that toddler and you are really engaged in something that you are doing. And someone comes in and towers over you about 10 feet tall and just grabs you and say, let's go bye-bye. This may stress that child a little bit because, first of all, it takes him out of his element of play. Second of all, this is somebody who has just came up and all of a sudden wants this child to change a behavior. If you really look at it, this child becomes stressed. 
And this is where some mindfulness, some mindfulness need to be used where the adult may be lower themselves and maybe sit on the floor with the child. Bring themselves down to that child level and prepare them to put their play toys up. Prepare them. Put them in the present moment to want to leave and move on to another type of environment. Also, you may think of it as at this age, as I mentioned in the definition, that children begin to recognize pictures of people that they know. Sometimes when the parents leave or let's say the father is on deployment, you can use pictures to put that person in that present moment of them knowing that dad is okay, this is dad, dad is okay, this is mom, mom is okay, I'm just the babysitter, mom will be back soon, dad will be back in a few months. So just trying to process with kids at this young age, mindfulness is a benefit to them. Coach Baker, can you explain why psychologists believe that social and emotional learning is just important as reading, writing, and mathematics? Social and emotional learning is just as important as math, science, reading, or writing. Because in order for those to be acquired by the individual, they must be focused totally when they are acquiring knowledge from their teachers. With social and emotional learning, students learn how to manage their problems, they learn how to manage their emotions. They learn empathy. They learn how to make reasonable decisions. And they learn how to have healthy relationships. Studies have shown that students that acquire a effective curriculum and social and emotional learning, 50% of them, 50% of them graduate from college and they also usually have a job by the age of 25. With social and emotional learning, the individual begins to see themselves eternally. They begin to respond instead of reacting to different situations. If we look right here, let's say this right here is our brain. Right here we have 60,000 thoughts a day. We wake up in the morning, which foot to put on the floor first, we pull the covers back, we go brush our teeth, we walk down the hall, we kiss the kids, we, we take a shower, we go to work, we're driving to work. So 60,000 thoughts are on your mind, but with social and emotional learning, you have to find a way in order to calm yourself. And once you calm yourself, then you can put yourself in the present moment in whatever situation that you are in. 
if you are in the classroom and the teacher is teaching, you have to be present physically, mentally, and emotionally. If you are in the classroom physically and your cell phone goes off, you might look at your cell phone and now you are distracted. Then you might see something outside of the classroom. That distracts you. Or you might go into that class and you are angry from the day before because that particular teacher may have told you to pull up your pants yesterday and that made you angry. So you have to be totally focused and with social and emotional learning, these are the interventions that are used. Let's look at a toddler. Now let's say this is the brain of a toddler, okay? And that toddler is thinking, well, I'm hungry. I got to change my diapers. That toddler has so many thoughts also. But when you take that toddler and you use music or you use any type of intervention to calm that person, That's when social and emotional learning takes effect. As I really think about it, social and emotional learning helps one to respond instead of react. There have been many situations at the alternative school that I worked at where young men have been in prison or have been killed. And I truly believe that if they would have thought about responding instead of reacting, they may still be alive or still be out on the streets. But when you learn that responding is better than reacting, then that's when you can be able to have better relationships with people. That is when toddlers who have tantrums, when they can get over having tantrums, then they can learn better, they can associate better, uh, they can have better relationships, they won't be bullied. But for you to react when a teacher says something to you or when someone on the street says something to you and you react, it can turn into a gunfire that where you might lose your life. When you look at your brain, if you look at your brain, this is known as the prefrontal cortex. Okay? This is known as the lumbar, and this is known as the brainstem. Right here is most of your atomic or I would say automatic reactions. Like this is where your heart beats, your nerves, your digestive regulations come. Right here, the lumbar area is where maybe anger and emotions, fight and flight, anger and emotions. Your prefrontal cortex send messages to these areas to regulate them. So the prefrontal cortex is very important. When these areas are activated and are out of control, bam, you flip your lid. But if these areas are regulated by your free prefrontal cortex, which is sending messages down to them to tell them to fight or to flight, then you are in a much better situation 
when the signals are coming from the prefrontal cortex. Now, a lot of times, my students, they'll start yawning or they'll get real relaxed. And that is because if you look at this toddler with so many thoughts, once they do mindfulness, then the brain stem, the lumbar, and the prefrontal cortex is only thinking about one thing. Let's say we have a five-year-old and we set that five-year-old down and we tell that five-year-old, we're just going to think about the sounds around you. Now, the brain stem, the lumbar area, and the prefrontal cortex is only thinking about sounds around them. Once that happens, everything is relaxed. The more a person can focus on one thing only for a period of time, then they start to create space. This is when the brain waves are wired and you begin to develop a wireness of brain waves that will help you to focus and to be in the present moment. Coach Baker, what would you consider some downfalls or some drawbacks when it comes to mindfulness? Yeah, there are some drawbacks if you think about toddlers and you're trying to put them in a present moment or just people in general, psychologically you have to be careful because, again, all people, all toddlers grow at a different rate, think at a different rate. There have been some studies where people have really lost it or sort of gone off on the deep end when they were set with, for instance, let's say you think about a loved one or you think about somebody that you hate. It may have been a tragic situation there. So you have to be careful about that. Penicillin may be good for everybody, but penicillin may be harmful to others. So you have to be careful with mindfulness. Also, some people consider the origin of mindfulness coming from a Buddhism origin. That's a negative effect to some people, but it's not about religion. Mindfulness is simply a teaching tool that I use to help kids and to motivate kids to be in the present moment, not thinking so much about stress all the time, not having your mind in this region but having your mind with a prefrontal cortex that is regulating. Right here is where the responses come to combat the reaction. I want to thank you, Doc, for interviewing me today, and hopefully this information will be helpful to parents of toddlers and infants. Thank you.